Good evening. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here tonight and to talk to you about the idea of why you would want to model the energy performance of buildings and cities before you design the cities and why the uh, city is being operated and used. So why should we be caring about buildings? Well, since you are attending this uh, event tonight, I'm sure you're aware already of the fact that within our uh, overall uh, carbon emission budget, buildings account for roughly 40% of that. And that really constitutes a problem because once you have an energy, energy inefficient building stock, it takes a really long time to change that. If you have inefficient cars, after five, six, seven, ten years, the cars are replaced. But with buildings, we are stuck. So I always like to use this quote from Goethe who said, one can make mistakes but should not build them. So um, what do we do if we don't use a computer to design a building? What's the process that a lot of people all across the world, specifically in the US, go through? So let's design our dream house. Uh, imagine you and your significant other. You just bought a little house in Cambridge, really small, uh, turn of the last century house and you spend one winter in there, you have an enormous energy bill, you're freezing to death, and so you decide, well, we got to do an energy retrofit. You get an architect uh, to hire you for that, and the first thing the architect's gonna tell you, you need a bigger house. So at least thing, let's put a little extension to that, and then you go shopping and you find out, uh, really, with all these appliances, I need a laundry room, a kitchen room, I need a big TV room for the Super Bowl, and uh, of course you're designing that super green, because see, this is facing south, big windows, you're doing everything right then nobody knows where the in-laws are going to stay for Christmas, so you got the bedroom, you got the sunroom, everything. This is a super green building. You know, it's facing south, we minimize uh, area to the north, this is great. You buy some bicycles, put them in your garage on top of that, uh, and then you realize spending the first summer in there that all these solar gains that were great during the winter wasn't really wanted in the summer, so you put on some shading on your building, and then you invest the rest of your cash in PV and of course the mandatory green roof on your building. And so you went through all this process and you got this super green building and then after a few years you compare the energy uh, bills that you get now to the ones that you got when you get a little house and they're actually the same. So uh, by using an energy uh, simulation program that can help you at least predict this. Nobody can save us from our own desires but at least we can know beforehand what's gonna happen. So when you want to model a building like this in a computer, what you're going to do, you abstract the building. So you say, I have a building that consists of different thermal zones, and each zone is represented as a node. So then you have this nodal network that's automatically set up by a computer that defines the relationship between the rooms and the outside. You add them components on occupant behavior, solar radiation, and so forth to it. And there you have your sim thermal simulation program. And this is, of course, widely being used during the design of high-performance green buildings. So all our elite buildings on campus, when you look them up, they went through this process. But you can ask yourself the question, well, what happens when I model a building that's non-green, such as Gant Hall, home of the Graduate School of Design? It's a very typical building, so we just wanted to see what happens when we model something like that. So in 2008, we made a seminar actually here where with 12 students, we uh, put a weather station on the roof, we spied on the, our colleagues and on the students, how much coffee are they drinking, when are they in their building, how many computers do they have, how many personal heaters. We put all this in an energy model and compared it to the metered energy use. And what we found is that for electricity and for heating, we were pretty much bang on, and for cooling, we were completely off. So I first thought of failing everybody in the class and move on, but then we said, well, maybe let's spend some time and look a little more in detail what went on. So we looked at historic data for our building. And what you see here is the cooling use of this building over three years. So in the past, it was what you would assume. In the winter, we have low cooling demand because it's not exactly warm outside here in the winter. And then that was normal until in 2008. After some renovation work and new server room, we suddenly had this high cooling load. And of course, this was being raised by those that paid the energy bills, but it was all blamed on the server room. So what we basically, uh, I insisted, I said, you know, I don't think this, uh, this, flow, um, this meter is right. I think our model is, uh, is right and your measurement is wrong. So when the meter was being replaced, basically, we saw that the uh, cooling load of the building dramatically was reduced. And so this new flow meter pays my salary right now. Um, so what do we learn from this? We learn really that by testing our buildings, uh, whether our buildings work properly, we can save a whole lot of carbon and energy without really any costs. So now we can as well use the same technology to look in the future. Already I'm piggybacking on uh, Professor McCarthy's work. So uh, 
we can predict for the different scenarios um, the climate of the planet. There's a process called morphing where we can combine the weather data that we're currently using for our building models with these future scenarios, and that allows us to predict what might happen in the future. So if I apply this, for example, for Gunt Hall, this is our heating and cooling use from our calibrated model, so we are pretty close. We understand what goes on in the building. When I turn this forward, the, uh, clock, uh, the clock forward, that means in 2080 for the A2 scenario, which is more middle of the road, we'll be using 36% uh, less energy for heating our building and 45% more cooling. So this is really a big effect. But then we run into the problem that a lot of, our, um, that of my colleagues already raised. Well, if you're an owner, you might think, oh, this is kind of interesting, but you really want to know how this affects your personal bottom line. So what we've tried to do last year is basically combining this future climate scenarios with prediction of how energy prices are going to change. So all these storylines have some built-in energy price prediction, so we are now possible to say for a different future, how much energy are we going to use and how much is it going to cost us. So um, we are applying this to a little case study here. Imagine you have a really boring office building from the 80s in Waltham, and you're thinking as an owner right now, well, am I going to upgrade it and to what level? So the minimum you have to do, you have to bring it to code that would cost maybe $90,000, and then you can do extra. So should I do extra or not is the question. So what we're doing here, what you see on the left-hand side, we are predicting for the baseline for minimum, medium, and advanced renovation how much the building is going to cost us over the next 70 years. So in the case already, when we don't take climate change into account, we would predict it's going to cost about $1.5 million to us. If we take climate change into account, it's going to cost $2.1 million. So that's something you want to know, and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty attached to that. And then you see that the numbers fall um, depending on how aggressive your retrofit is. Well, what for the economists might be more interested in is the internal rate of return. That's where we're looking at, if you have a quarter million dollars, should I invest it now on Wall Street or should I invest it in my building? So we are predicting uh, internal rate of returns between 8 and 10%, which can be interesting in these times of uh, economic uncertainty. So with, based on the success that we've had at modeling individual buildings, we are now expanding out. So let's look at modeling whole cities. So why we should be doing this, of course, you've all heard since 2008, more than half of humanity lives in cities. In 2050, we have 9 billion people on the face of the planet. So it will be very cozy. Cities such as Rio and Shanghai are growing at incredible dimensions, so we should give people tools to develop more sustainable cities. So this is a, a screenshot, an idea of what we are uh, teaching in a new class at the Graduate School of Design called Modeling Urban Energy Flow. So for the National Science Foundation, we are developing tools right now that starts modeling the interaction between different buildings. And you see here a little bit how that works. These are all identical, really boring buildings. But when we place them in context with each other, those that are red use more energy than those that are blue. So you can start coming up with a sustainable urban master plan. And we are calculating things such as walkability that gives you an indication of how walkable is a neighborhood, so how close are you walking-wise to Starbucks, to a park, to a restaurant, or to a school. And we're also doing calculations prediction of the daylight within the city. So by looking at this really multiple metrics for, uh, for evaluating the sustainability of a city, we want to empower architects and planners who are designing new neighborhoods. But the interesting part is in North America, of course, a lot of our cities already built. We can use the same tools to model cities that already exist. So we're doing that right now with the city of Cambridge. We have the ArcGIS model, which is an incredibly rich data set. So we know for everybody in Cambridge, uh, basically building footprints, exterior cladding, cost of your building, age of your building, floor plans, number of bedrooms, and that's legal. We are allowed to know this about you. We are not allowed to know uh, how much energy you're actually using, but I'm sure we'll be getting there. So we are combining that data actually with LiDAR data. LiDAR data is based on flyovers and laser measurements. We basically have a very detailed massing model of the whole city. So when you took these two pieces of information together, we can model um, solar radiations, for example. That's the first step. So what you see here, this is a Cambridge Commons. This is the building we are in. This is the Graduate School of Design. So we can tell you which part of your roof is going to get how much solar radiation. So the plan with the city of Cambridge is that we have a searchable website. 
you type in your address and you get told, well, your move is great, so your building is in the lowest percentile, don't bother about it, do I want to put PV on my roof? But at the same time, we're also going to model the energy performance of the building and say, well, this is how much energy, according to us, you should be using, how do you do? How do, you do? So that there is this uh, way of cross comparison. So as a final thought, something to take home from all of this, that working on the design, construction, and maintenance of energy efficient and comfortable cities is really, I think, the defining task of our time. And really, when you look at uh, how money currently works, as long as energy is as cheap as it is, we cannot le really leave it up to the building owners. We have to come up with this fancy ways of explaining people why it's worthwhile investing into energy efficiency. And I really think there's a huge opportunity for those of you interested in technical aspects of maintaining building. We need a wave of well thought out startups to change the way we control and maintain buildings. So the building sector really has the problem that it used to be extremely slow, conservative, and really dull. So with this new type of technology, you can basically spice it up a little, and how cool is that when you can tell people that you modeled 17,000 buildings on your laptop uh, for lunch. With that, I thank you.